This is the Reason Speakeasy with Nick Gillespie. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for coming out. Uh, we are recording in Midtown at the Blue Building, which is also the home of the Psychedelic Assembly. And uh, we are talking tonight with the authors of The Canceling of the American Mind, How Cancel Culture Undermines Trust, Destroys Institutions, and Threatens Us All, But There Is a Solution. I don't know about that subtitle, but we have the authors. They will explain it along with everything else about the strange world we find ourselves in. Greg Lukianoff and Ricky Schlott, please welcome them. <laughs> Greg, as I suspect many of you know, is the uh, head of FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. And he's also the co-author of a previous best-selling book called The Coddling of the American Mind. And his co-author this time is Ricky Schlott, who's a New York City-based journalist, who was a fellow at FIRE, a researcher, and has, is a New York Post columnist, uh, is a host of the Lost Debate uh, podcast, and also at times a Reason contributor. So please give it up for Greg and Ricky. Okay, so let's start with the subtitle. Okay, the book is called The Canceling of the American Mind. And then the subtitle is Cancel Culture Undermines Trust Destroys Institution and Threatens Us All, M dash, but there is a solution. Yeah. Okay. There was some debate about that. I wanted an emoticon in there. Okay. I, you know, that might have kept the sentence going, but uh, <laughs> why don't we start? Uh, Ricky, what is the, what's the elevator pitch for this book? What, what is it about and why is it relevant now? Well, I think it's twofold. Uh, on the first front, people are still saying that cancel culture does not exist, which is absolutely crazy and defies all statistics uh, fundamentally. But also, cancel culture is not just about the people that are torn down. It's about the epistemic crisis that it creates and the devastation of the body of common knowledge that we all share. And, um, and also the undermining of trust in between people interpersonally. And for me as a young person, the, the undermining of, of being able to grow up and have the freedom to fumble and make mistakes as well. So I think it's important on a ton of different levels. I have to say, as an old person, <laughs> eh, you know, tough. <laughs> you should have been born when I was born. But um, would you, um, uh, Greg, what is the def working definition of cancel culture? Uh, it, it's uh, basically we're trying to give it the, the name of this historical era that we're in. I'm a First Amendment lawyer. I'm big on the history of freedom of speech. And a lot of what we call mass censorship events have names. So Alien Sedition 1798, um, even though it's really the Sedition Act of 1798, uh, Red Scare 1, 20s, uh, Red Scare 2, also known as McCarthyism, etc. PMRC, the, com uh, the, the comic book scare. So basically we're proposing more or less that this be a historical definition of a unique and weird period where there's been a lot of people losing their jobs because of their opinion. That's really, one of the things we're trying to show is that this is on par with any of these previous moments of mass censorship and actually exceeds them in terms of numbers of professors fired. Yeah, talk a bit about the professors because I mean there are a couple of different sites, right, or locations where this is particularly strong. Yeah. Academia, clearly one of them. What are the numbers that you're talking about? Yeah, so um, th this was an interesting thing. We now have a great research department at FIRE and that was, you know, a par partially a labor of love on my part because I was always the lawyer who was pretending to be FIRE social scientist. Um, but we've been able to grow it. That's how we we actually have our campus free speech rankings, which is based on the 13 different factors. So real quick through the stats. Um, so, and our definition is uh, the, uh, the uptick of campaigns beginning around 2014 to get people fired, deplatformed, expelled, and, um, and the culture of fear that resulted from that. And I think it's always important to root numbers in, in comparisons. When I started at FIRE, um, I started, I actually landed in Philadelphia at 9, 10 a.m. on 9-11. All, all of my first cases were involving people who said jerky or insensitive things about uh, the attacks or people who said, let's go get those terrorists, but said it in a, in a con con considered to be a rude way. 
Um, <laughs> We, we now know, and it was, so it was a bad period for academic freedom. There was a moral panic, and it actually followed the normal MO of mass censorship events in history. There was a national security crisis. That's usually the way it goes. It's either a national security crisis or a large-scale war that you have these mass censorship events. Um, and it was bad, and everybody knew it was bad. Um, and 17 professors were targeted um, for being canceled, as we would say, which basically means like punished for their speech. Um, there are more students as well, but we we're pretty small at the time. So, you know, we know that we don't probably know a fraction of, of the students who got in trouble. Uh, three professors were fired. That's really, really bad historically. Having um, like one professor being fired, Stephen Salida, resulted in an entire uh, issue of the American Association of University Presidents, uh, University Professors, to do a, a whole summer issue on it. And all three of those professors, by the way, were justified under things that weren't related to speech. Um, Ward Churchill had a pretty long history of academic misconduct that was real. The One of the other ones, Samuel Arian, um, was fired because of ties, real ties, to uh, t terrorist organizations. And the third one was fired on, on the basis that she stopped teaching her class for a substantial chunk of time and talked about something that wasn't related. So again, bad, chilled speech, period. I wasn't used to professors getting fired, though, and never tenured professors in my early career. For cancel culture, we're talking about over a thousand attempts to get professors fired um, or punished in some way. About two thirds of them result in someone um, being punished in some way. About one fifth of them, about 200 result in them losing their jobs, um, which by the way, like the number during McCarthyism of people who lost their job um, due to being a, a communist is about 62, 63. Um, they count other people who lost their opinions in this massive study that they did right towards the end of McCarthyism. Um, and there were about 90 fired for their opinion overall, which is usually rounded up to 100. We now think that they're probably somewhere between 100 and 150 fired. So 200 people fired means it's worse, like in terms of like actual numbers. What and is the, what's the time period that you're... 20, uh, 2014 to, uh, to, to, mid, uh, to, to mid last year, to right. July. And the, the period that's considered McCarthyism is 11 years. Right. It, it, it's, 50, it's 47 to 57. So we still, we still have time, but I did, did want to add one more uh, uh, stat. Uh, one in six, we know this is a t crazy undercount as well. One in six professors, according to our, our, our survey, one in six say that they've been either threatened with investigation or investigated for their academic freedom. That, that means the numbers are absolutely colossal. Students, about 9% of them say that they've, been, uh, they, they've actually been faced sanctions for their speech. That's an insanely huge number. And about one third of professors say that they've been told to avoid controversial research. So we know that we're just, we're, we're only seeing a portion of it. And this isn't simply what they're doing in the classroom. This is outside of the classroom It's, as it's well. three things, it's research, pedagogy, classroom um, and uh, an extramural speech so which um, means which means talking as a citizen you you open the book and uh, the book is really well structured uh, you have kind of a, a chapter that talks about a general discussion and then you have case studies the first case study is at Hamline University Ricky, remind us what happened there and why it exemplifies cancel culture. Absolutely. So recently there was a case there that I think um, was unusual in the sense that it just got widespread disdain from across the political aisle because it was such an egregious case of cancel culture and a liberalism on campus. But there was a professor named Erica Lopez Prater who um, decided to show in in one of her courses a an image of the Prophet Muhammad, which is considered sacrilegious by some by, say, by some people who follow Islam. Um, and so she said in her syllabus that that was going to be on. She uh, in in a class, she told people that you could get an excuse uh, from class if you, if it's un untenable for you to see that. She warned them multiple times ahead of time. She gave ample warning in every way, shape, and form. And also just, just told everyone that the only reason I'm showing you this is because there are some sects of Islam that do not find this offensive. This is a piece of art that was by a Muslim, uh, commissioned by a Muslim king. And in the end, she ended up being squeezed out of her job for doing that because one student did show up to that class, decided afterwards that she was offended and did a, basically like a PR, uh, like a press conference, right? Yeah. Basically saying that she was, she'd been so offended and aggrieved and the president of the university came out and said that this is beyond freedom of speech, this is just offensive. And, and she ended up getting squeezed out for that reason. And it was a perfect example of cancel culture just defying common sense, defying um, just pluralism and democracy in a, in a very fundamental level. And so that's why we decided to call this one out as our, our first opener because 
pretty much everyone condemned it in the end. It was it was unbelievable, and Hamline did have to reverse course. And if there's a well, actually, the, the, ending, she's still fired, and, yeah. and the university president stepped down. But more recently, they basically said that they did the right thing in this case. And and and, and one of the best articles about this is actually Amna Khalid, who's a Muslim, and she said, "I'm offended as a Muslim, but she's offended at the idea that all of Muslims should be offended by devotional art because the, M- Americans can be very parochial sometimes. My, both my parents are foreign, and they they just kind of assumed, oh, every Muslim would be offended by this. I'm like, that means you." don't know enough about what you're talking about. Uh, Yeah, I was going to say the happy ending there is that the university president kind of got pushed out. Yeah. Right. But what what you know, part of cancel culture is what happens to the principles in a, um, you know, in some kind of controversy. What was the reaction of other academics? Because that's also a big part of the book. Um, you know, what, what was the professor, you know, were, were their speech rights or their pedagogical freedom, academic freedom upheld? Or were people like, no, you know what, like, yeah, that was This a was a problem. positive case in the sense that people really came to her defense. The, the idea that she wasn't rehired <laughs> in the face of it. Is really stunning. Penn America was involved. Of course, Fire was involved. The uh, American Association of University President uh, Professors came out and and condemned it. So it was a moment of of some amount of unanimity, but it somehow wasn't enough at the same time. Um, one of the other places that you talk about, um, you know, cancel culture being writ large is journalism and the yeah. media. Um, why don't we let's talk about the uh, case of James Bennett, who was the New York Times opinion page editor. What happened to him? Well, the, um, one thing I wrote an article about this, basically rem- trying to remind people that James Bennett, you know, was and part of what they wanted him to do was help fix the fact that in 2016 the New York Times was like, "Wow, we're incredibly out of touch. We really didn't see Trump happening." And then you added people like Barry Weiss to the staff. You added people like. Um, uh, Brett Stevens, you know, the, both of whom they got from the Wall Street Journal. There was an attempt to actually uh, have more conservatives involved and, and also to have people like James Bennett, who seemed to be, you know, uh, open to co- covering things from all over the political spectrum. He, he was our editor when Coddling of the American Mind uh, came out at, 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 the, um, at the Atlantic. Uh, and uh, so that was kind of the setting. But, but then there was, you know, I think you can tell the rest of the story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so so Tom Cotton, who's a sitting senator speaking the minds of a plurality of Americans at the time, um, made made an op ed case for bringing troops in to quell BLM riots and protests. Um, obviously controversial, but also a viewpoint that is worth hearing if it's a sitting senator and if that's something that a lot of Americans are are animated to do at the time. And shared and, by the president of the United States at the same time. Yeah, no, no kidding. Um, and and as a result, I mean, this is something that's frightening to both of us as, as civil libertarians, that prospect. But as a result of just that op-ed being published, there was a widespread petition at the New York Times that a ton of their, I think in the hundreds of their employees yeah. signed saying that they felt unsafe being there. Um, there were people torn down, including Bennett and and also Barry Weiss at the same point in time ended up resigning. There was an institutional meltdown over a viewpoint that was widely held that should have been tolerated. And in the end, instead of of, of tolerating just the person who signed off on that op-ed, we had to tear him down, not just the person who even had the opinion in the first place. So I think, you know, there's a, a really, this is a near and dear uh, case study in my heart because I'm 23. I only recently started my career in journalism. And I think that there's a really profound effect that this is going to have with the next generation of young people who might be more heterodox, who might be in the center or right-leaning like myself, who say, I I can't go into the lion's den at an institution like this where you really do want the 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 biggest and most respected newspaper in the country to be a place where different viewpoints can collide. Do you do you think for you and you know you're a columnist at the New York Post, you've written widely elsewhere. Does it you know just on a pure reaction level, does it make you think does it chill your speech or does it make you kind of more extreme and say I'm not you know screw the New York Times, which is Essentially what Barry Weiss did, right? She said, I can't take this anymore, and I'm going out onto the frontier, and I'm building my own shining city on a hill, which is the free press. Uh, You know, just how do you think you respond to that? 
I mean, for me personally, 2014 is when we say that cancel culture started. I was 14 at the time. That's when my political consciousness really developed. And honestly, like I had a reactionary period of time where I saw wokeness go way overboard or illiberalism on the left. I, I associated liberal with illiberal, which is something that I've now grown out of and I understand the broader context. But I think that there is a, a considerable threat that the generation of kids who come up in this censorious age where um, they feel like they can't say what they mean or or they see um, institutional stupidity, a term that that Jonathan Haidt coined for um, just the, the culture of conformity that happens in these left wing institutions, you're going to have reactionary young people who say, well, I'm not that. So I'm going to go even further to the right or tack to the opposite side, which I which I don't think is a positive thing either. Yeah. Um, Greg, could you speak to, you know, in your capacity as a lawyer, like one of the things I was striking about the Bennett case and the book is filled with episodes that the reader will either remember vaguely or it's like, oh, you know, and then it is kind of amazing. I mean, it's it's like a terrible version of uh, Proust where you get this <laughs> backflow of like, oh, my God, I had forgotten about that or whatever. But what was going on when everybody at the New York Times who was commenting, they, they kept saying, I feel unsafe, yeah. unsafe, unsafe. Is that like HR speak? Is that, is that like a, a secret word that, you know, is the equivalent of hitting a buzzer or something? One of the reasons why they're saying they were unsafe is because they had a general policy of, of not criticizing, you know, the, the paper unless you actually think someone made you, like, unsafe. So that it was actually kind of a loophole that allowed a lot of these reporters and employees to come out and demand, you know, that, that something be be done against this horrifying article. Um, so it, it was really kind of like they were gaming the, um, the HR system, really. You're right. And I think also they were um, a lot of younger employees who went to college like myself on the back of my ID card at NYU. It's here's 911 in the campus safety office and a crisis hotline for your mental health and then the bias response hotline to report speech. So if you if you grew up, you, got, you went to college, your administrators are saying report those around you if you feel unsafe or or offended on campus. And then you show up at a college and you'd, you'd been coddled by those administrators all the way through then certainly you're going to abuse HR in the same way that they just become your new bias response. Well, and it's a point that we made in Coddling the American Mind. We call it sort of intermediated um, experiences. And I think we've made a horrible mistake by teaching people in a free society that when you face a problem with someone individually, call an adult and keeping that going. For <laughs> but on another level, for the whole rest we... of your life. That is also, that makes sense, doesn't it? Call, call, uh, so uh, if you're on a playground, you know, and a bigger kid is picking on a smaller kid. Yeah. You know, you don't expect the little kid to go like, hey, you know, we really should sit down and, you know, work this out, right? Yeah. I mean, a lot of us actually did that as yeah. kids. We got a couple of guys who are ready to work you over in the parking lot. Yeah. Right? Uh, but, no, but what I'm getting at is, is... Is that idea of the intermediary, um, you know, in what would have been otherwise? And I, I don't know exactly how that would apply to the New York Times thing, but is That's it... HR. HR is has it, become yeah, the intermediary. Is it... Uh, but I'm saying, would they go after uh, Tom Cotton? They would be, you know, I am never going to Arkansas ever again or right. whatever. Um, but, um, you know, is it that these were good ideas that got out of hand or are they bad ideas in the first place to have that kind of intermediary institution within a workplace there there are ideas with pluses and minuses like like most things um but clearly we've been sounding the alarm that they were getting out of hand and could be abused to to to, to punish speech and this is something that fire co-founder and my mentor harvey silverglate was warning way back in the 70s i'm like these regulations are much too vague they're going to be used to stifle speech and meanwhile one thing that we point out in the book you know i, I definitely have a little bit of a social science temperament so i, I like to point to impersonal factors and that yet actually you went to law school. You took the easy way out. I, it's true. I had a ton of fun in law school. It was great. <laughs> um, let's talk about psychotherapy. This was, oh, no. again, you know, you will, the um, most you will remember of the book. many of these stories and whatnot, but what is going on with therapy where, uh, and the way that cancel culture has kind of worked its way into you know, if there is one relationship where you are supposed to be away from all of the hurly-burly of life and be able to talk openly and honestly 
with somebody. It is with your therapist. What's what's going on there? Well, well, this is near and dear to my heart because, you know, like my experience with Kylie and the American Mind started with me being hospitalized um, for depression back in the Belmont Center in Philadelphia back in like 2007. So the idea that you would actually have um, psychotherapists who think they should intervene if you have wrong think um, in your mind uh, when you're talking one on one with them is about as horrifying as I can imagine. And it's no exaggeration to say I'm not sure I'd still be here if I actually had a psychotherapist who corrected me. And as far as a chapter that we could easily expand into its own book, and maybe we should, the psychotherapy stuff scares the living hell out of us. And I have, I know people who are actually getting their clinical psychology PhDs. I know, I know uh, we talked to a, a number of practitioners. Um, we, more has come out since the, since we finished the book, Barry Weiss had some articles about, you know, intervening. Camille Foster talks about, um, who, uh, from the fifth column, um, and also a fire board member. Uh, he talks about going to therapy and, um, he needs a lot of therapy. <laughs> I'm just saying, no judgment, no judgment. He's working on it. That's what's good. He was going to couple, he was going to couples therapy and, um, he got told, uh, that, well, maybe your problem with this relationship is that it is your internalized racism, like your internalized, like self-hatred, uh, self-hatred. And he's like, I'm paying you for this yeah. <laughs> and, and dropped out. But we hear these uh, Brit, Brit, British fantasy like talks about this as well. And uh, in terms of like uh, what I've heard from the existing clinical psychology programs is that they will pain over the nightmare scenario of what if it turns out the person I'm treating is a Trump supporter or a Republican. And of course the answer is then you treat them compassionately, not, <laughs> not you have to drop out, you know? One of the, uh, you you know, in the coddling of the American mind, you talked about three great untruths yeah. that, you know, are governing a lot of our public discourse. And in this book, you add a fourth one. Could you just run through what the three great untruths and then what's what's the special uh, cherry on top that comes out in this? I should, I should answer that one. So the, the great untruths are these ideas that basically um, they contradict modern wisdom, uh, ancient wisdom, and contradict uh, modern psycho psychological thinking, and will make you miserable if you believe them. So the first three are um, what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Always trust your feelings, which sounds deceptively nice, but is terrible, terrible advice. Life is a battle between good people and evil people. A, a like, if you believe that truly, you're going to have a miserable life. And we added a fourth one to this one. All, uh, no bad person has any good opinion. <laughs> to make the point that the way we argue, the cancel culture is part, one of the things we try to argue is that it's part of a dysfunctional way of arguing that we should not tolerate. Um, and one of the tactics uh, that we use way too much is, oh, here's my argument. You did something terrible 15 years ago. I don't have to listen to you anymore. And it's like, wow, like that has nothing to do with what their actual opinion was. So I always give the example of um of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Miserable human being. Absolutely terrible, awful to David Hume, awful to his mistress, gave all his kids up for adoption. Probably uh, something but in yeah. His defense, that was probably better for the kids. That was probably better for the kids. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a good point. But that doesn't mean he's wrong about everything. I think he's wrong about a lot of things, but I don't think he's wrong necessarily about everything. And we understand that intuitively, that just because someone's terrible doesn't mean they're, uh, they're wrong. And just because someone's great and really nice doesn't mean they're right. Um, did you, you know, in a, in a way, Ricky, you are kind of, coming through the, or, you know, coming of age in the era that you guys are writing about, did you experience that, uh, you know, particularly this one where it's like, well, you, if you are a, uh, you know, you're a bad person, so you have bad ideas. Like that's, where, where did that start showing up in your uh, kind of educational experience? Um, well, for me personally, I, I was in high school in the lead up to the 2016 election, and we just had a scourge of cancel culture explode, even though we were still teenagers. And I, at the time, was more worried about boys and acne than than Trump. But we we I saw that in mass scale um, for the first time. It was really frightening to me. Um, and frankly, it, as a result, I self-censored for a while. And by the time I got to NYU, I knew I was in an ideological minority as a right 
left-leaning libertarian here in New York City. Um, and I actually started hiding books under my bed when I moved in because I was a, a new freshman and 18 and trying what to make were friends. The books Thomas were Sowell and Jordan Peterson under the bed, <laughs> banished, <laughs> which they're now loud and proud out on my shelves. And we just did Jordan Peterson's podcast. So cancel me now, please. Um, but I think that it's it's the reason that I brought up my age in our elevator pitch is because I think it's so important to realize that there is a crisis of authenticity with young people who are growing up, who are supposed to explore different ideas and be an anarchist one day and a communist the next day and figure it out in the end. But we've taught young people that any of their missteps or any of their heterodox opinions are grounds to tear them down. That's no way to grow up. And actually, if you look at generation to generation views of cancel culture, uh, the older people tend to be more negative on cancel culture and then it goes up and up and up till you get to millennials who are apparently very gung-ho. But then Gen Z fundamentally switches that and actually has the most negative view of cancel culture of any generation. And that's because you cannot be a young person and grow up in a graceless society. Um, okay. Uh, there, there is a special place in hell and in your book for Yale Law School. Oh, yeah. Um, and I suspect, Greg, that's because I'm betting you went to Stanford. I'm betting you didn't get into Yale. <laughs> but I'm just, and, you, and Stanford comes in for a lot of abuse as well, uh, rightly. But what is going on at Yale that is so awful? Well, Yale is kind of where, it, it, to a degree, it started. The, you know, the, the um, attempt to get to cancel Nicholas and Erica Christakis back in 2015 was, uh, and I was there. I actually want to videotape the confrontation. Was frankly one of the most depressing things I've seen in my entire life. Um, the the minority students in particular had no better friend on the campus than Nicholas and Erica Christakis. The people are like saints, and they're also brilliant, by the way. And in 2015, um, that there was a, what, what people f forget to mention is there was a whole kind of there were about uh, there was a whole rash of sort of what would later be called sort of Black Lives Matter uh, protests on campus, which were, you know fires psyched to defend. The only problem was a lot of them were demanding that censorship happened, that uh, the, the one started at University of, uh, was it Wesleyan or University of Massachusetts, that, that um, a, a paper, you know, so, like a student paper stopped printing, you know, for example, there was a cancel attempt about someone who's trying to be very nice at Claremont McKenna to a student, and apparently she wasn't nice in the right way. And so this was happening all over the country, and it seemed to be kind of like there was, a, and only lasted for one semester. And in this case, this was something related to a Halloween message that Yale had produced. Uh, I think a, a like a diversity group, a semi semi official, saying, um, "Don't dress up offensively for Halloween." And, you know, some people will argue, oh, but you have to understand the context. And I'm like, I understand the context. For five years, Halloween had been the biggest disaster on campus at, uh, what was it, like Cornell? Um, there was uh, a really creepy statement that students find wearing uh, uh, offensive costumes may be asked to disrobe. And I was like, that's messed up. So... So the so we talk a lot about some of the details of the Christakis case that, 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 that haven't been made public before. But if that was the only case, then Yale would be comparatively fine. But I looked at it, and every single year we were having some kind of crazy case at Yale. We had the case where the student at the in the law school was talking about um, he, he, he was a, a Native American student. He sent something to the multicultural societies, you know, uh, organizing a party and said, and said it, it's going to be a total trap house, you know, which he thought meant place to, you know, have fun, like, like drinking beer in your, but apparently the argument was that because trap house was originally a name for a, a like a drug dealer's place that came out of black slang that that was deeply offensive and this guy needed to apologize to everybody. And by the way, they already wrote the apology for him. Um, they implied that he might not be able to be a lawyer. Um, they, they basically said like, oh, but you know, you have to, you have to pass this uh, character judgment and you know, and it's like, wow, like nice legal career. It's a shame you said this one thing that we don't approve of. So, and, and of course the, the shout down that, that, that happened with Kristen Wagner, people really need to get Shoutdowns at elite law schools are not normal. <laughs> um, what happened at, my, at Stanford, very shameful. We have a whole chapter on it. Um, and what happened at Yale was really, was really. Did you just talking. recap very quickly what happened at so Yale? So this was interesting because it was a very well-known um, left-leaning constitutional lawyer 
and uh, Kristen Wagner from the Alliance Defending Freedom, who uh, conservative, there to sort of kumbaya about what right and left can agree on. They were, they were going to talk about freedom of speech. And uh, I think more than 100 students showed up, you know, shouted it down, had to be escorted out. It was it, it was a train wreck. And, and I believe they had to cancel the, the event early. And, you know, I don't think any charges were brought against any students. But the thing that people really need to know is that every time this happens on a college campus, whether it's a deplatforming or Carol Hooven getting fired uh, or, for that matter, the, um, the, the Nicholas Krasakis situation, universities need to do an investigation to figure out, did the administrators do anything to stop this? And did the administrators help put this together? Because when it comes to the Carol Hooven case, that was all started by a DEI administrator. This is a professor at Harvard who argued that biological sex is real on Fox News and ultimately left um, due to the backlash. Um, the same thing, even I didn't realize this when I asked Nicholas Christakis. There were a bunch of DEI administrators in the angry crowd that surrounded him and was shouting. Uh, and in this case, the idea that the administrators who actually brought the charges against the kid who said trap house, all of them should not be at a university. Um, so I, I think that we're, what, we're, what we're missing is a lot of times people think, oh, you're just blaming the students. I'm like, no. This, it's something with the students and some administrators working together that actually created this, uh, made this so severe on campus. And I, I might add that we spend a lot of time talking about Yale and Stanford and Harvard just got an abysmal rating and then the by far the lowest rating on Dead free last. speech rankings for fire. And I think that it it's important because these are the schools that funnel kids into the most um, influential positions in society, but they do hold disproportionate weight because elite colleges are inculcating illiberalism at a rate that other schools aren't. And I think that it, it does distort our vision of young people in the next generation because I, I find that people are so often shocked to hear that Gen Z doesn't like cancel culture, but that's because there are a lot of the us, like myself, who are proud dropouts or didn't go to college or didn't go to the hoity-toity colleges. And there are a lot of young people just, who still- Just Columbia. <laughs> <laughs> I am a proud dropout. Yeah. Um, but I think I think it's important to realize that there are there are a a whole host of young people who did not come from this this squeaky wheel tyranny of the minority group of people who do show up in institutions and scare the life out of everyone. But the fact of the matter is, whether it's young people or American people at large, 80% uh, of Americans think political correctness has gone too far. The vast majority of people do not want to live in a world where they're tripping over tripwires at every turn or censoring their speech or biting their tongue for fear that someone will give them the worst possible interpretation of what they said. This is a tyranny of the minority and courage is contagious and there is strength in numbers and I think that we really can fight back with that knowledge um, yeah. Yeah, you know just to uh, stay at Yale for a minute longer too it's Yale was also one of the birthplaces of critical legal studies um, which can you talk a bit about where where does this cancel culture come from sure absolutely we spent a fair amount of time on it because um, well, it, it, we actually to be honest, we, we go through it fairly quickly because we... It's a very good read. I mean, there's a lot of pages, but you, it's, it's a good read. So the free speech movement began in Berkeley in 1964, and the anti-free speech movement began at UC Santa Barbara in 1965 um, with a person who gets a lot of credit these days, but he really has it coming, uh, Herbert Marcuse, a name that you've probably... How many people are familiar with this name? Yeah. Yeah. So Herbert Marcuse was someone who showed, who fled Nazi Germany and showed up and realized how bad America was um, and was considered the guru of the new left and, this, um, and wrote something called Repressive Tolerance, which you really need to read because it's supposed to be a great intellectual who wrote this. And it's not more complicated than my side, good people, bad people, no, no free speech for bad people. Um, because, and he really, he, I forgot that he literally says regressive, so-called conservatives, the right, basically like his idea is to have a truly free society, or Orwellian if there ever was, we need to actually be intolerant of regressive voices. So it's very explicitly a call for censorship against the right, you know, for, for, and, and unfortunately, pe there were people who actually took him seriously and actually agreed. Now, for a long time, what, what I describe as what I still consider myself, the, the liberal leaning left actually was winning, that essentially free speech was ascendant. It was doing pretty well for a while. But over that, over the time, and one of the things that cri about critical race theory, even though it's come up a lot, and Fire will defend your right to teach critical race theory, and we have um, gone to court to defend it. 
But I do think that every time someone mentions that, they also need to say, oh, and by the way, that's where speech code started. That was Herbert Mark. Uh, that wasn't Herbert Marcuse. That, that was um, uh, uh, Richard Delgado, Mary Matsuda. All, basically, all of the founders of critical race theory um, were uh, actually, you know, co-authors of the, of the Words That Wound book, um, right. which is all about the hate speech movement. And this led to the speech code movement uh, from the first article that came out by Richard Delgado back in 1980. So this was very intentional. And and like I was saying about being into social science, I like the impersonal kind of ways of explaining things, big, broad trends that people don't have as much control over. But you have to be really clear. The anti-free speech movement was to a large degree in incredibly intentional and continues to be. Yeah. Um, to stay at Yale as well, there was something co uh, that came out in the mid-70s called the Woodward Report. Can you explain what that is? It was and so great. Yeah. It was so terrific, and they specifically disavowed it in court. <laughs> The Woodward Report was this wonderful report um, that came out in the 1970s, um, and I think that was really. I think the, it was 75. Yeah, uh, right. I don't think it was 75. Oh, that was 70, I don't know. Well, anyway. I just read your books. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, the uh, uh, so it was it was talking about the right to question the unquestionable. You know, it, it was a stirring defense of the importance of freedom of speech, even for speech that we find deeply offensive, and it was supposed to be kind of one of the things that really set Yale apart. And they haven't been living up to it for a long time. But one thing that was kind of sobering to see is them actually going to court in a case where actually there were it, it was more of an attack on someone, you know, uh, the, the, more of an attack on someone for saying things that were uh, more of an attack on the right that they were they were in a litigation against this one professor, and they specifically disowned, you know, the, the the Woodward report, basically saying, oh, that's just more or less arguing in court that that's just puffery. We didn't really mean any right. of that. And it was named after C. Van Woodward, yeah. who was a sociologist on Yale's faculty, who actually coined the term approvingly new left. Yeah. So he, you know, it, uh, just as Berkeley is no longer the home of the free speech movement, it's interesting to see Yale kind of turn completely in the opposite yeah. direction. But I, but I will say again, Harvard really impressed us by coming in not just dead last, but actually getting a negative score on the campus free speech ranking. <laughs> so what does that mean? They're stealing people's words? That means you, uh, <laughs> it's like mimes all over campus now? That or? essentially, you, you get negatives for you know deplatforming and firing professors. And we didn't actually think that we'd get in a negative number. So we, we rounded up to zero in the case of Harvard. And they came at us uh, w w with some people being like, the methodology is crazy. And I'm like, oh, an opportunity to defend our methodology. Largest study ever conducted of student opinion. Largest study ever conducted. Uh, largest database of professor cancellations. Largest database of deplatforming. Largest database of speech codes. And largest database of student cancellations ever assembled. Um, and you really want to take us on on this. And, and, now, and now I think they're starting to get it a little bit um, that, that, they, that they have a problem. Uh, let's talk a little bit about right-wing versions of cancel culture, which you go into the book. Now, uh, you are not saying that this is perfectly uh, parallel or diametrical, right? But what what is, what's the right-wing version of cancel culture that we're seeing now, Ricky? Yeah, actually, it surprises most people to, to hear that about a third of attempts to get professors censored or fired are coming from the right and attacks on professors to the left of them. Um, and that tends to happen less in the the really shiny institutions that garner the headlines and more at smaller schools, but it's still meaningful. And I think that um, it's 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 definitely true that the the headlines for cancel culture have been pretty domineered uh, by by the right wing conservative media because there's the campus wokeness gone crazy. But it does happen in mass on the right. Um, there's intergroup cancel culture in a way that I think is uh, really frightening on the right. We talk about David French, for example, who's maligned for having some some different views about Trump and, and conservatism. Um, I think especially in the post-MAGA era, there's a reflexive response to anyone who might be critical of Trump or to doubt Trump to cancel them or to squeeze them out. Um, we talk about Megyn Kelly as an example of that, who gave me my first job in media and was squeezed out from the right and then from the left um, in a pretty spectacular fashion and a, a demonstration of how one person who is or at the time was in pretty much the, se the center right area could be canceled by both sides. Hmm. Um, there's also the uh, divisive concept laws that are proliferating throughout mostly uh, Republican-held states or yeah. red states. What are divisive concept laws and how do they apply 
to K through 12 and higher education. Yeah. Um, th- so divisive concept laws are ones tr- uh, uh, passed in, in state legislatures across the country um, that uh, by, by Republican legislatures that sometimes actually try that primarily focus on K through 12 curricula. Um, and but also sometimes focus on books you have in the library. So on the K through twelve, but also but, but most importantly, there are there was one law, and I do really want to emphasize this. There was one, be, um, and it's really bad in Florida called the Stop Woke Act that focused on higher ed curricula. There were some others that focused on getting rid of DEI uh, ad- administrations, but if you mention that as being terrible without mentioning that DEI administrators are often the ones enforcing. Um, the orthodoxy on campus, you're missing a huge part of why it's actually not bad for academic freedom to, to, to actually reduce those departments. But when it comes to the Stop Woke Act, it was laughably unconstitutional. We told everybody. It basically said, like, they actually argued in court that under this law, you could uh, have a critique of affirmative action, but you couldn't be pro-affirmative action in, in, in the class. It's like, thank you for explaining how incredibly unconstitutional this is. And we warned everybody that was unconstitutional. They passed it anyway. They took it. Uh, they um, uh, we, t- we 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 took it to court. We won uh, fire one one in court. We got a ruling saying that it was positively dystopian, and and and, and it was. So so the ones uh, the the one that actually applies to curricula in higher ed are left unconstitutional, but so far there's been one of them. And why is it different? Uh, like, why do states have more rights to censor things at K through 12 where it's mandatory than at colleges where it's voluntary? Well, that, that, that's the thing. It's, it's mandatory, it's taxpayer funded, and it's your kids. The idea, and I, and I this scares me. So you me. have, the state gets to dictate more control. Oh, absolutely. I mean, like, and what I've seen that scares the hell out of me is um, s- some advocates clearly, clearly seem to agree with the former governor of Virginia that we should just let education school graduates completely control the public school uh, system and decide what gets taught. And I'm like, that would be a disaster. An awful lot of what we've seen go, go wrong in higher ed, including the horrifying sort of North Korea-like University of Delaware program, those are the products of, of education school graduates. So as long as it's mandatory, as long as it's state-funded, as long as it's your, your kids, there should be de- democratic oversight on that part. It gets a little more complicated when you get to the library stuff, because K-12 through libraries, there's a, there's a case on point called PICO that talks about, that makes the point that you shouldn't be banning a book just on the basis of its viewpoint. But of course, that gets a little complicated as well, because you can also consider things like age appropriateness. Where does the right wing cancel culture from? I'm betting Ron DeSantis is not a big Marcusean. <laughs> right. um, but I mean, where where does it come from? I mean, I would say as someone who is right leaning and who grew up in a context where I, I realize now wrongfully I associated illiberalism with liberalism um, just because of the context of the years that I grew up in and the the world that I grew up in going to a boarding school and then to NYU. Um, I, I've, I've realized that the left completely left freedom of speech, which used to be a fundamental principle of theirs, up for grabs. And anyone could grab that mantle and say, here's the restorative, pluralistic, democratic vision to move forward. But instead, I think that we've seen quite a lot of people on the right just fight a liberalism with a liberalism and fists with fists in a way that is just so infuriating because I do believe that there are a plurality of people in the middle who actually still want to hark back to those principles that are what make America such a, a, a wonderful place to live in and, and potentially a place where we could actually fix problems. But instead, we're fighting fists with fists in a way that is so disappointing to me. Um, let's fist the cuff it up a little bit. And why don't people who want to ask a question, you can form a line uh, up here. Um, But uh, while we're waiting for people to amazingly quickly line up in a way (laughs) that I was not anticipating, uh, we'll get to you very soon. But we are now a couple of weeks uh, into a war between Israel and, uh, you know, Palestinians or the Hamas government of the Gaza Strip. Is it, and we have seen in New York City as well as all over the country and all over the world, some insane uh, speech being done on college campuses in places like Times Square by public figures, by private figures and things like that. Can I ask you, how do you, how does cancel culture fit into this is good or bad? Should, uh, for instance, among the right, uh, there has been a call to Uh, say anybody who was a member of an organization that signed a letter 
promoting Hamas or, or you know, justifying Hamas. Uh, the most famous instance of this is a letter from Harvard where 30 plus uh, That is groups, entirely Israel's fault. Yeah, that, 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 you know, they are entirely to, to blame. Is that cancellation if you say anybody who is uh, one of, a member of those groups should never work again? Is, I mean, is that a form of cancellation I, or I, is that I, I think legitimate? So. Is it yeah. accountability I, culture? It, accountability culture. Um, I, you know, I've been on TV talking about this and I think it is still cancel culture. I mean, just the fact that it's um, cancel culture that many people agree with doesn't make it not cancel culture. And I don't like blacklists. I, I, I like to actually deal with people individually, find out what they really think about something, you know, give the benefit of the doubt. Um, so, Cancel culture is always about now to be clear, do companies have the legal right to hire who they want? Mm -hmm. Yes. And I, and I oppose laws actually saying that they have to hire. Um, but I do want people to take a deep breath, uh, take, uh, go, uh, take some distance and say to themselves, what if we live in a country where every company was also not just a widget shop, but also a political shop and the boss's politics decided who got to keep their job? And it's not that fanciful because that's what it started to look like in 2020 and 2021, where people were getting fired for just having, you know, mildly critical BLM uh, statements. There was a, a huge amount. They were being fired for supporting BLM or being against BLM. Uh, for, for, for being even mildly critical in some cases. Like we, we saw huge numbers of cancellation. I and mean, what happened on campus? was insane in 2020 this year like we've never been as busy as we were uh, during that so I want people to consider what the world would look like if essentially you have a, fir a first amendment but you can't have a job if you actually honestly say your political opinion I will give one caveat though to the Harvard students um, I think that a big part of the problem we have as a country is that we too reflexively hire elite uh, college graduates uh, I think this creates serious problems. And I think you should try to find out when you're hiring from elite college campuses. It's like, okay, no, I understand you have a view that I find abhorrent. Can you work with people who disagree with you? And what, I, and what I'm hearing from a lot of employers is, is uh, not only are they not really clear if these are actually the best and brightest they're getting from these schools. Um, I was about to say any more, but they never really were. Um, but le less, less accurately than it used to be. But they're also potentially getting someone who will show up and demand that you fire your you know, mildly Republican IT guy because they can't, they can't stand his point of view. And credit where credit's due, Greg actually walks the walk. And in order to hire me to be a fellow at FIRE, he changed a rule that he didn't even realize was on the books that required people have a college degree. Yep. And I think that it's really important for people and employers to realize that there are 4 million fewer college students today than there were a decade ago. There are a lot of kids who are actually going off that trail because they think they can tread their own path or because they've seen kids graduate with degrees in feminist dance theory and t hundreds of thousands uh, of dollars in debt. There are very few feminist dance theory majors. <laughs> Let's be honest, but... Um, but I think but the point being them, that there, there are a plurality of these young yeah. people who are genuinely determined to pave their own path. And I give credit to employers like Greg, like IBM, like Tesla, like Google, who are dropping degree requirements and jobs where that's appropriate to to broaden out the the pool of possible applicants to kids who did, a, did take a different path and didn't get mired in this illiberalism for four years. What would happen at a place like FIRE if you, you know, if somebody had truly abhorrent political beliefs. Um, I mean, because it, it seems kind of easy to say, well, you know, we would talk to them individually, and as long as it didn't interfere with their work. Um, is that possible, though? Um, we definitely try to maintain message discipline as an organization. Um, and, and if someone, there was a situation that actually happened at the ACLU uh, where Chase Strange, Where you used to work. Where, 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 yeah. where I worked back in 99 where a employee actually said of Abigail Schreier's um, irreversible damage that, you know, uh, that they get it, like getting rid of this book is a hill I'll die on. Mm -hmm. And the president of the ACLU said, well, we have political diversity at the ACLU. And I was like, well, I've worked there. I question that. Um, the uh, fire really does have that. But if I had someone stand up and say at, at a meeting, I now support a book ban just for one book but I support book bans. It's kind of like, you should find another job. All right, let's uh, go through questions quickly. No preambles, just a sentence. What's your question, sir? Michael Myers. Why did FI have to change its name in order to become the ACLU? And what is happening in terms of the pushback from the fire 
and the ACLU in terms of the, um, the blacklisting of people who are protesting in New York City for Palestinian rights, who are, who are being blacklisted by employers. What okay. are you doing? Thank Abridged you. version, what happened to the ACLU? And what's going on with people who are being blacklisted for supporting Palestinian rights? I've been calling that out for, you know, all week. I mean, the, we, we, the, Alex Mori has been on TV all over, all over this stuff. I mean, Vivek Ramaswamy, it, you know, even came out and said that blacklists are wrong. And, I, I'm, and I've, been, I've, been, I've been consistent on that. Um, when it comes to what happened to the ACLU, you know, like ours, what we say is that there are still really good people at the ACLU. David Cole, someone that I have tremendous respect for, will work with the ACLU uh, whenever, you know, we we agree on a case and we have worked with affiliates kind of our, our entire history. Um, when it comes to why FIRE became the foundation for individual rights um, and expression instead of in education, it's partially because we wanted to do uh, do things in a way uh, that we think we wouldn't repeat some of the mistakes. Because one of the things that we thought was a mistake that the ACLU made was having 19 practice areas. And FIRE is only going to do free speech. And another thing is we thought that their defense of, of freedom of speech was becoming too technical. It was basically, it began and ended at, at, at the First Amendment. Um, and we actually argue for a culture of free speech, something bigger, bolder, older, th older than that. Um, so, you know, we want to be the nation's premier uh, free speech defender, and I think we're getting there. Can you just very quickly talk about how, I mean, you make the argument in this book as well as in previous work that essentially our understanding of the First Amendment is an expression of a more robust free speech culture. Absolutely, yeah. So just kind of explain that. Well, it's kind of weird to even have to argue about free speech culture. And I actually had a debate with Ken White about this in Reason, and we both don't understand each other's point at all. Um, the, the, the worst argument that I've heard against cancel culture, in my opinion, is that um, uh, uh, against free speech culture is that it's an argument that bad people make, that, uh, that essentially like Republicans utilize this, this argument cynically. And I'm like, I'm sorry, like I can't take seriously the idea that bad people make the argument, so I shouldn't too. But we're in a, we're, we're, in, we're in a common law country. The idea that there's no relationship between culture and law doesn't make a lick of sense. And of course, where do you think the First Amendment came from? Was it, a hand, was it the uncreated Quran handed down? No, it was something that a number of people valued the idea of free speech enough that they put it as the first substantive um, a, a civil liberty in, in, in the Bill of Rights. The other, the other two that they had were... Pretty and yet good. it took, you know, 150 or more years to get to a point where you could kind of publish dirty books well, without it, being arrested. There's a great book called The People's Darling Privilege by Michael Kent Curtis, which I recommend to people, that talks about how back when the First Amendment meant very little legally, which was pretty much all the way up until 1925 and then beyond that a little bit, um, one of the things that actually meant that free speech wasn't wasn't in a complete free fall for at least some of that was a culture of freedom of speech, a cultural appreciation that, as we you know say in the book, everyone has a right to their opinion. Right. And I would add that that one case to make that the law on the books is not enough to protect you is that there are three countries with pretty robust free speech protections on the books that are Russia, North Korea, and Turkey. <laughs> okay. So you yeah. need people to buy into. All yeah. right. Thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, do you see a viable uh, legal uh, uh, reform, a legislative solution to cancellation by uh, payment providers, uh, communication platforms, uh, right. other distribution? Oh, great question. Um, uh, would you repeat it? Uh, do you see a viable legal uh, fix to payment providers, what, what's web architecture, um, discriminating on the basis of viewpoint? Well, FIRE has a very strong position on social media companies, that we don't like laws that come in and tell social media companies how they should editorialize. We do get that, like, if, if Congress tomorrow decided, yes, but when it comes to web hosting sites, when it comes to uh, when it comes to payment processors, you're not allowed to discriminate on the basis of viewpoint. You're not an express association and we know that if you don't if you have this uh, you know ability you're going you can destroy people privately so we actually when it comes to some of the web architecture stuff we are sympathetic to potentially saying you can't discriminate on the basis of viewpoint there but we do we do think that social media companies you know should not be regulated in the same way thank you next question hi in the beginning of this interview you mentioned that there are three periods where you had um, sort of the silence, silencing cancel culture in the past, the Red Scare 1 and 2 and the previous one. And Victorianism. The, 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 Victorianism. Yeah. So where are we now in this cycle? Like we're, mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's, it seems to be about power, the power to silence, the power to cancel, the power to get someone fired. 
what are the forces today and how do we know where we are in that cycle? Or do you see any indication that we're coming out of it or we're sure. getting more into it? Right. So where are we in the current cycle of sensorious behavior? Well, I sometimes think that analogies to the past deceive people. Um, that history doesn't actually repeat. It barely even rhymes. And you can learn things from previous moments in history, but it doesn't mean that things are going to work out the same way they worked out before. Um, and I think that it takes, you know, people fighting back uh, in, in order to actually change things. So I actually think the best parallel to what's going on now is not the Red Scare, a one or two. Um, it's not the Sedition Act. Um, it's actually the Victorian era. Uh, a largely upper class movement that thinks it's morally superior that didn't actually take place uh, during a national security crisis that actually had a sort of puritanical idea of what should be allowed. Now, how did that eventually end? Well, for one thing, it lasted a damn long time um, from 1870 to basically the end of World War I is when it started to be, started to be afraid about. There was a great group called the Free Speech League um, that, 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 that fought against it. Um, but there's no guarantee we actually pull out of this stuff. And, and it's one of the reasons why, even though we offer solutions at the end, we are under no illusion that this is easy. I don't think most campuses are taking the free speech problem all that seriously. I don't think they're taking seriously the idea that they have no viewpoint diversity and that's actually going to uh, hurt their function. Um, so I think that we need relatively massive changes to pull out of it, and I'm not currently seeing the political will to do that. So Ricky, do you see it uh, more in generational terms? You were talking about how a lot of Gen Z people, and maybe they're not the ones who can grab the mic, but they're like, screw this. Like, we want to be able to talk and whatnot. Do you see it more as, you know, social progress through a series of funerals? Mm, I mean, I think with young people, the, the problem is we've grown up so mired in this that we're self-censoring in, in a degree that um, I think it's something like 60 percent, according to FIRE's data, of students are self-censoring. And I can say in my personal experience, having gone to NYU, hiding books under my bed, then deciding one day, screw this, I'm writing an op-ed in the New York Post about free speech. I was terrified to do that. And, and the response to it was actually tons of people coming out of the woodwork who I'd known who were across the, the hall for me in my dorm or classmates sitting next to me for an entire semester, professors I'd have, uh, heads of departments coming to me and they'd all say, oh, I totally agree with you, but just don't tell anyone we had this conversation. And I think the problem is young people have just been so um, so coached to think this way, but also on the in terms of whether we're, we're towards the end of this or we could get out of this, I think it's important to remember that in this age of cancel culture, if you'd ask people, you know, I think 2016 was a big flare up point, ask people in 2018, is cancel culture over? They'd be like, yeah, it was kind of a weird thing and Trump happened. Then 2020 happened. And I think that we've realized now that in this um, in this modern age, any sort of social unrest that we have can really lead us down in a liberal uh, drain, I think. And 2024, I predict, will be um, equally as bad. Yeah, we're pretty worried about 2024. Do you think the current flare-up over the Hamas atrocities in Israel, is that you know, and and the back and forth about that, is that going to perpetuate this or is that the type of thing that actually pops the bubble? Well, here's the thing. Um, I would like to think that the sudden rediscovery of freedom of speech and for the first time really seriously talking about political neutrality, some, something that we, we support at FIRE, um, is something that makes us kind of like, oh, good, this is finally happening. But we're not naive. This, oh, this is what always happens. When the threat is from outside of academia, um, they, they they circle the wagons and they say, oh, academic freedom, oh, McCarthyism, uh, and, and and they suddenly, like, they, they find the Bible again. But when, when the threat comes from on campus, when it's students saying this professor is, is saying something that, that, that the, you know, the pro-Palestinian students don't like and we want to get this person fired, that's going to be the test. And the test can't just be that one test. They've got years to prove that they've actually rediscovered freedom of speech. Because if you look at the scale of sort of cancellations that have been allowed over the last 10 years, you know, you've got a lot to prove to the public. So this, I, people are telling me this might be an, an inflection point. Um, I will believe it when I see it. Next question. So piggybacking off of the predecessor's question, <clears throat> you mentioned about the Victorian area yeah. and everything like that. Choose your own adventure. How do we promote a culture of humility, which I know you mentioned in a recent yes. interview with Noam Dorman, or, and or how do we promote intellectual diversity in our faculty, at, especially at elite institutions, such that the solutions that you'd propose can thrive. And yeah. Greg, thank you for continuing the 
history and tradition of Alan Charles Coors' immaculate facial hair and <laughs> his leadership yeah. fire. It's all about the beards. Oh, man. Ricky, you and I are shit out of luck. <laughs> So uh, let's uh, tackle that question of ideological diversity on uh, college campuses. Is that a, uh, a it's serious extremely important. reform? It's, it, it's extremely important because groups that, are, uh, that don't have enough political diversity tend to get much more radicalized in the direction. That's a group polarization that's really well established in you know, social science when it comes to that dynamic. Um, and we're not talking about institutions that have a majority kind of left leaning. We're talking about ones that have super majorities and very, very small minority of, of conservatives, some departments with and no. It's, I mean, it, what, it's like 80 20 at a lot of schools yeah. where it's just most professors uh, either define themselves. I mean, is it usually you're using Democrat and Republican registration? That, that's proxy? one of the ways you can do it. Yeah. Um, and, and definitely the numbers are actually worse than 80 yeah. 20, particularly, particularly in elite colleges. And I'm just not seeing the genuine effort to actually tr try to address the viewpoint diversity problem. And I'm not sure higher education can or necessarily should be saved if it's not willing to do this, which is one of the reasons why I talk about if there was some crazy, insane test on, on the humanities that only someone like Nick Gillespie could pass, um, you know, one out of a, a million people could pass, I think that would be a much healthier way to figure out who the hardest working, best read people are than sending them to Harvard today. Mm. Uh, next question. Uh, it seems to me that maybe the, the cancel culture might be the latest manifestation of an innate uh, instinct toward uh, lynch mob mentality. Oh, yeah. Do you have, deep. So do you, do you think there's anything we can learn from past instances, and are we doomed to repeat this forever, over and over again? Yeah, I think the um, one thing that we try to hammer home in the book is the fact that censorship is mankind's natural tendency, and we're all extremely fortunate to live in the relatively tiny sliver of history post-enlightenment where we realize that dissenting views are worth being heard and that free speech is a value that we should uphold. Um, and I think that we we actually we call it censorship gravity in our book, um, which is the idea that like much like you you might slouch, like you need to be like mindful to set up straight and to, to roll back your shoulders and society needs to do the same thing because we've spent such a relatively tiny fraction of human history not burning our heretics at the stake <laughs> and unless we are very mindful and actually continuing this free speech culture and embracing those values I do agree with you that we will slip right back into that um, very fundamental base instinct and burning books is terrible for the environment right <laughs> so um, let's do one more question and then we're going to, uh, talk a little biography and wrap up. Sir. All right. Um, I, uh, I'm wondering if you have a hunch about an earlier, uh, year where some of this may have started. Uh, I graduated in 2008 and I've always been kind of curious about the 2014 mark. I know that's when a lot of the metrics yeah. in colleges and that kind of thing became noticeable, but I know that even graduating in 2008, I was aware that college seemed there seemed to be a move away from principles of free speech yeah. very much by that point so do you have a hunch as to I, like Marcus was 1965 yeah there was some you know did something happen else to I me? mean it was a, a slow build up you, basically the, the the like the liberal the pro free speech liberals to a degree had to kind of die off and I think that actually for a lot of my career that's one of the reasons why campuses weren't completely awful. Um, they were bad. When I started in 2001, campuses were worse than, than I thought. And I was kind of screaming my head off saying, no, the, the students are now good on freedom of speech. The faculty is OK. It's administrators that you got to worry about because they're actually the ones teaching people illiberal lessons and the ones who are bringing the charges and getting people, students ex uh, expelled, et cetera. In my first book, Unlearning Liberty, I talk about 2007 as actually being the worst year that I saw. And that was the education school driven, you know, uh, University of Delaware case. It also involved a case of a student who got, you know, um, expelled for a, a collage that they, they claim was threatening, was a completely ridiculous case. Um, and how small that case that 2007 was compared to what I would see later is, is, is I, I we knew that something bad was coming so I wrote a short book called freedom from speech back in 2014 talking about how because I, I I agree with Steve Pinker that essentially there's a lot of things that are getting better but I think there's a category of things that we call problems of progress that get worse because other things are getting better that essentially people you know who have more comfortable lives are going to be less comfortable with with disagreement with with the difficulty and ambiguity of actually arguing across lines of difference so um, I think that there are large societal factors that have led to this I think that there's a slow progression of lack of viewpoint diversity and the left that actually was 
anti-free speech kind of taking over. But as far as the thing that sped everything up, it's social media. So, social media took a, a number of existing trends and sped them up, but it also created some new ones because you couldn't really, like if you hated, you know, hated an article Ricky wrote, you'd send a, new, a letter to the New York Post and it'd end up in, a, in the trash can. Now, with everybody talking, uh, being able to talk at the same time, you can take all your sock puppet accounts and all your friends and suddenly make it look like there's a horrible movement to get rid of this horrible racist reporter I have, and I have to do something right now about it. So cancel culture was something, one of the reasons why we think it is a weird kind of thing that deserves to be understood as, as its own problem is it takes ancient instincts that are pro-censorship, adds a first time ever bizarre technology that allows billions of people to talk to each other at the same time. And, uh, you know, it created uh, some real madness. But it also um, on balance, or can you run the cost benefit analysis on that? Because isn't the world better off for social with social media? Oh, man. Okay. You're drawing me into 1521. Um, okay. So when I was uh, at law school, I did six credits on censorship during the Tudor dynasty. Um, and uh, it was my own design because I'm a nerd. Um, and in 1521, and then again in 1538, Henry VIII tried to put the um, genie back in the bottle of the printing press, uh, because as far as those years are concerned, this thing had been nothing but trouble. It led to the witch trials increasing, because that was one of the best sellers initially, was the book about how to spot a witch. Um, it led to uh, increased religious wars. Um, it, it was a terrible, horrible invention that kind of ruined For the world. the king. Um, well, it, it, as yeah. far as far as like from 1530, it, it, it was inc it was the original disruptive technology. Now, what eventually happened with the printing press? It allowed for massive disconfirmation, which is chip, which is getting closer to truth by chipping away at falsity because you had an extra couple million people, few million people in the global discussion. So ultimately, the benefits of the printing press were huge. In the short run, it was kind of disastrous. And I've kind of, and this is the thing I sometimes explain to Height, you know, or, or, or talk to him about, is just the idea that we are in an unavoidably epistemically anarchical period. We're, we're in a crazy period and there's no way to just uh, to, to get out of it. And I think the the early days of social media, in so many ways, like we're still trying to get our footing and figure out the the basics here. Um, both in terms of how do we engage in dialogue and online and and not tear each other down, but not censor people who are criticizing vociferously. But also on the on the front of of young people and social media and technology. I mean, even despite the fact that that's a very near and dear issue to my heart, um, having grown up with social media, having a ton of friends with with scars on their wrists as a result of being on Tumblr for their entire between years like we're still we're still trying to find the groundwork and the footing and despite that context and the fact that I, I I saw secondhand some of the the worst steps of what social media can do I am still a techno optimist I do think that we'll figure out as a culture when is it appropriate for kids to go online when is it uh, what are the the confines of speech that are, that is appropriate in a social media uh, world but we're in that crazy space where we just don't have any idea what the ground rules and, are and, and I really do hold out the possibility that those extra billion eyes on individual problems can, if we harnessed it better and didn't waste our time on cat videos and cancel culture, could actually be something that could help us figure out I like cat videos. Me at cat videos. I do yeah. love cat I videos. Do, yeah. <laughs> no, they're very uh, soothing. Um, and they are, the, they are the way forward. I mean, I think we all agree. Um, you know, it is interesting to think about it being in the early stages of social media because we, and especially if you um, think about it, the broader term participatory culture, which really started cranking up in the 90s. People are like, oh, no, this is never going to change. We're never going to learn anything. But, you know, Greg, you were citing uh, the problems that Henry VIII had with the printing press. A century later, there was another mass profusion under King Charles, uh, you know, starting under King James in England. And, you know, there was a period where tens of thousands of pamphlets were being published on, a, on an annual basis. And, it's kind of glorious when you look back because it gave voice to a lot of people, Absolutely. but it's ugly. Um, let's close out by talking a little bit about these steps of how do we get to that place where we're doing better. Um, one of your, in the part three of the book, you talk about what to do about it. Uh, one is raising kids who are not cancelers. I always get scared whenever I hear that the children are our future. <laughs> having been one and having given, you know, having fathered too, but um, how do we raise kids who are not cancelers? 
Well, I think that the most important thing that gives parents a leg up right now is realizing that most young people actually know whether or not they understand free speech basics. They understand that they don't want to live in a graceless cancel culture society. So there are a couple of things that, that parents can do. One is lead by example and actually be mindful of the fact that, for example, for me, I was never offered a debate club at school. I was taught pretty um, implicitly that that words can wound and that uh, differing viewpoints can be dangerous. Uh, and parents need to take care to counteract that and not just take for granted that their kids' schools are inculcating those values. It's a, a, it, You should be playing devil's advocate at the kitchen table. You should also teach people, I think this is the most important thing that kids need to realize is that there's strength in numbers and that if their friend gets torn down, if they're a good person, it doesn't matter if, if they agree with the speech that they're getting attacked for, but they need to stand up for their friends because every single person today that is getting a new job, getting their first job, I had an iPhone when I was 10. We all have stupid bad stuff in our past because we've been overly online and our digital footprint is massive. But we need to all realize that we need to have a ceasefire. And until we do, that young people need to be willing to stand up for their friends and to say they're a good person and you're attacking them and maligning them in, in an unfair way. Uh, Greg, one of the other uh, chapters that you talk about is keeping your corporation out yeah. of the culture war. So any CEOs in the audience, please perk up. What, what does that mean to keep your corporation out of the culture war? Well, part one is try to make sure you're not handling counselors, uh, hiring counselors in the first place. Make sure that you actually have something in the screening saying, again, can you work with people you disagree with? And, you know, I think most employees will say, sure. And it's like, really? Like, and then ask them kind of like, what if, what if a fellow but employee... But it is interesting. Like, if somebody says, no, I can't, then you, <laughs> you know, okay, next, But you, you should right? name particular yeah. issues, you know, yeah. like, like, like saying kind of like, what, what if I think I'm totally on Israel's side on this? Or what if I think... Biological sex is real. You actually, we do this at fire. We actually give them like real examples of like, can you defend this speech? Because if the answer is, eh, we're not hiring you. <laughs> um, so I think that the screening process is a big part of it. I actually think that you know, that a lot of corporations are going to uh, find out, just like universities, the tremendous benefit of political neutrality, of not taking a freaking position on everything going yeah, on in the you world. You talk about Coinbase, yes, uh, the crypto exchange. Um, explain what they did. Their CEO, Brian Armstrong, at one point in time just drew a, a line in the sand and said, we as an institution are viewpoint neutral. You're perfectly welcome to have your own politics in your own time, but we're not going to make any stances as, as a corporation. And they said, you can either take it or leave it. And around 5% of their employees left it and actually <laughs> packed up as a result. And those are the 5% of people that you just don't want working for you. <laughs> so more power to I them. Mean that is kind of an elegant solution. They got a payout to go away, and they're better off. And yeah. then the the you it's know, a win 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 win. Um, what about in a uh, you know universities uh, to bring it back to you know the current situation um, in Israel? Uh, universities love to shoot their mouths off about yeah. all kinds of things. Should universities, you know, Greg, in your perfect universe, would universities never talk about anything other than higher education? Or should they be, you know, is the problem that they're making too many statements or that they are not making the right statements or that they're just hypocritical? In, in, in my perfect universe, um, every university would adopt the, a 1967 University of Chicago Calvin Report, which is a very strong admonition not to take political positions. Like we, we are not the speaker. We are the forum for the speakers and the thinkers, which I think is the right attitude to have about higher education. However, the fact that they decided to do this now when they've talked about every other issue ever is something I'm also, I have something in the OC register talking about like how cynical, like you should be cynical, you should be skeptical. They're discovering this, you know, partially for cynical reasons because they're too, and, and by the way, you know what this comes from? This comes from cancel culture because like what happened at Harvard, the way you're able to have students who think, think everyone's gonna think my position that, uh, that Israel is entirely responsible for these horrific attacks is, you know, it's a pretty commonly held opinion and that people are probably gonna disagree with me and that's, and that's, that's normal is partially because people were too afraid to actually say, no, that's nuts. Uh, so cancel culture partially created that. But the other way that it created it was, I know that a lot of these university presidents support Israel. I know that they actually thought the Hamas attacks were absolutely horrifying, and they were too afraid to say so because they thought what their careers are, might, ask, might be what over. What are they afraid of? Because there's no question that you know Americans... Uh, broadly speaking, you know, I mean, a massive majorities as well as 
people in universities would be, of course, these are horrific, barbaric attacks. They're, they're afraid of three things. Their faculty, their administrators, and their students. Not all of them, but the most activist ones are the ones they're afraid of. Um, the, finally, uh, and I'm not exhausting the entire part three, what to do about it, but you uh, talk about the adulthood of the American mind. Explain what you mean by that, Ricky. Yeah, so this is the the conclusion of our, our book where we really make the case that we all need to buy into this free speech culture, that the only way we can supplant cancel culture is by going back to the old idioms that so many Americans were raised up with, like to each their own. This is a free country. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion because they think we've underestimated just how far we drifted away from that. Parents have not realized that they need to be aggressively mindful in instilling those values into a generation of young people who've been taught the op absolute opposite, whether it was in K to 12 or in college campuses that words can wound and always trust your feelings and that you can insulate yourself. You need safe spaces and trigger warnings. We all need to buy in to fight back against this tyranny of the minority of people who want to tear other people down to exercise cheap ad hominem attacks and dodge actual meaningful conversation because that's the only way if we actually want to move forward in a diverse and pluralistic society, we need to be able to have civil conversation and dialogue about the touchiest and most contentious issues. And unless we actually mindfully fight back against cancel culture, we are just going to slump down into dangerous and illiberal tendencies. All right. Thank you. We're going to leave it there. We have, this has been The Reason Speakeasy, which is a live taping of The Reason Interview podcast. We've been talking with Greg Lukianoff and Ricky Schlott, authors of The Canceling of the American Mind cancel culture undermines trust, destroys institutions, and threatens us all. But there is a solution. Please give them a big, big round of applause.